Hello, I'm Kathleen Olive, and today I'm speaking with Limelight Arts Travel team member Nick Gordon about Artemisia Gentileschi's painting Judith Slaying Holofernes. Painted in the first years of the 17th century, when Artemisia was just 20 years old, it was produced in a tumultuous period of her life as she moved with her new husband to the Medici's Florence at the conclusion of the trial for her assault by her painting tutor in Rome. A large, dark and complex work, it tells the story of a courageous Jewish heroine as much as it taps into Florence's own idea of its civic importance, tells a story about violence between men and women and also suggests the kind of strength that can be found in companionship. Hi, Nick. Hi, Kathleen. I thought maybe today we could talk about a painting by Artemisia Gentileschi. I think that sounds like a fantastic idea. And which painting uh, of hers have you got today? I have selected a work by Artemisia that is on the theme of Judith slaying Holofernes. And this is quite a large, almost life-size oil painting on canvas that is now in the Capo di Monte Museum in Naples. Could you please describe the painting for us? Certainly. I mean, it's quite a gory painting to describe, but this is a scene in the penumbra. We've got a quite strong light being cast onto a male figure who is reclining on a bed made of white sheets, which really amplify the light in the lower part of the painting where he is. And he is struggling to push off two women who are simultaneously pinning him down at the same time as one of them draws a short sword through his head in the act of decapitating him. And if that wonderful splash and spray of blood all over the bed linen there as well as the sword uh, slices through his neck. You sound almost happy to talk about those sprays of blood, Nick. Well, it's kind of there's something about the, the posture of it. It looks like Artemisia uh, has seen animals being uh, slaughtered before, the strength in her arm as she drags back his head to open his neck up. Uh, it's as if she has had a look at a slaughterhouse or has kind of been you know, visiting the local... Uh, butcher. Well, this is, it's a really common scene when Artemisia painted this in, and we should say she painted two versions of this work. This one we know was painted in 1612, 1613, which is right in the period that she moves to Florence for the first time. So her father was a Tuscan, he's quite a well-known painter, Orazio Gentileschi, but he'd made a career for himself running in the same pack of artists as Caravaggio in Rome. And I think most of us are familiar with the really disturbing events of Artemisia's adolescence when she's in fact assaulted by her painting tutor and her father decides that he's going to take that assault to trial. After the trial, which was a very uh, difficult experience for Artemisia, but one that did eventually lead to her vindication, her father arranged a marriage for her to a very minor uh, and it would seem unpleasant Florentine painter called Stiatesi. And she moves up to Florence with him immediately following the trial for her assault. And this painting is one of the first paintings that she makes in Florence after arriving there. And we might see this as a particularly violent episode from the book of Judith that makes up one of the the books of the Jewish scriptures. But in fact, it was a really common scene in Florence because Judith, as the little guy triumphing over the big guy, was a female equivalent to David, who was the little guy, of course, who, who triumphed over the big guy, Goliath. And both Judith and David were kind of icons for the city of Florence. They represented how Florence thought of itself in the political landscape of Italy, always the little guy triumphing over the big guy. So although it's quite a shocking scene to uh, to have represented, and although it's maybe even more shocking for it to be represented by a woman artist in the early 17th century, it was a really common and popular subject in Florence, and Artemisia paints two versions of this. So in fact, this is the first version that she paints of the scene, but there's a quite similar version of this scene that she paints a few years later, which is still in the Uffizi Art Gallery in Florence, whereas this one, as we've said, is in Naples.
So it's interesting there that you're kind of highlighting that there are, uh, there's perhaps a personal dimension in the work, but there's this more common political dimension in the choice of subject matter. When previous painters had depicted this scene, did they show it with a similar amount of violence? That's a great question. I mean, I think with Artemisia, um, the the way in which she's been viewed as an, a woman artist from the early years of the 20th century when she was kind of rediscovered, in inverted commas, as a great Italian woman artist, because in the ensuing decades we had, of course, the really important work of feminist art historians that was done in terms of bringing Artemisia's career back to the recognition that she'd certainly enjoyed in her own lifetime. It is really hard, I think, for us not to look at this scene and read it as some kind of cathartic working out of her personal story, and that may certainly be a dimension here. But your question, did other artists who represented this scene show it with the same amount of violence? Well, the answer is frequently yes. So in Florence, it was quite common from the time of Donatello to show Judith triumphantly holding the head of Holofernes or with her foot on his neck as she uh, has finished the job of severing his head from his body. But in fact, other artists in the 17th century were showing this scene with, with as much physical violence. And one of those who's often thought to have been an influence on Artemisia's representation of this scene is Caravaggio, who shows in a, a very famous work that's now in an art gallery uh, in Rome. He shows a similar kind of uh, composition. His is uh, ordered in a, in, a, in a more horizontal format than Artemisia's very vertical uh, representation of the scene here. But he also shows a scene with quite a lot of physical violence uh, as, as Judith undertakes the very uh, – difficult physical work of uh, severing the head of a, a drunk but conscious man from the rest of his body. And there's something about this that when you mentioned that the Caravaggio is wider, there's something about the vertical nature of this one that seems to compress it. Uh, and maybe that's what's kind of giving this extra sense of force, the degree of intimacy between those three bodies struggling uh, with one another in that contained vertical space. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And some, and some of that sense of containment or constriction is posterior to the painting. So, in fact, this painting was at some point in its history cut down. And the version that we see in the Uffizi is a little bit more pulled back, so to speak. We can see a bit more of the bed, for example, a bit more of the body of Holofernes kind of disappearing off into the gloom uh, in, in the uh, background of this painting with that really convincing youth, use in both the Capo di Monte painting and the Uffizi painting of Chiaro Scuro, you know, something else that Artemisia may well have been influenced uh, by in Caravaggio's work that she would have seen in Rome. So strong contrasts between light areas of the work and the dark areas of the work. So part of that sense of being pulled into the scene of these three bodies grappling with one another is because of a subsequent history of the painting. But I do think that you're onto something and that what Artemisia is asking us to do here is look onto a kind of slowly turn turning wheel of violence and she gives us to uh, that to us in quite a strong close-up because of the way in which the the central whirling action of all of those arms pushing pulling grabbing slicing they actually have a, a cyclical circular movement that really occupies the very center of this painting and that's quite a different view so you asked did other artists show this with as much violence yes but did other artists show it in this kind of slow awkward fumbling but inexorable uh, violent end no that's something that I think is quite unique to Artemisia's way of showing this scene I'm just recalling other painters who, who had done this and sometimes uh, the maid is much less involved than she is in this. So, for example, when the maid is an older woman who's standing on the side with a basket waiting to receive the head, whereas in this, the maid is part of that action you're describing. She's quite central to it with the way that her arm and Goliath's arm make that very strong vertical and the way that her gaze is so intently down at the place where the knife is going, or where the blade is going through his neck it kind of she's central to, to the the composition rather than peripheral 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she forms, as you say, a, a very clear vertical axis with Holofernes below her. Uh, and Judith is kind of zooming off on a really strong diagonal that gives us sense, along with the, the very musculature of her arms, of the kind of physical force and intent that's required to do this. I think Abra here, the, the handmaiden here, Abra, she, as a young figure, as we see her here, rather than a kind of an old crone, as we're typically shown her, Caravaggio gives us her as an older woman waiting to one side, for example. To have her as a young woman really helping in the physical action here, I think is Artemisia's way of conveying something of the reality of this situation, which is that although Holofernes is drunk, so Judith is the, in the, in the telling of the story, the Jewish story, Judith is a very beautiful and virtuous woman who is trying to help her people escape the oppressive yoke of Holofernes and his army. But the Jewish army feels that they've done everything Everything that they can to uh, hold him back and it's only Judith who has the moral fortitude even though she's a vulnerable woman to go into the enemy's camp to prepare a wonderful dinner a very seductive dinner for Holofernes and then whip out a sword and decapitate him when he's expecting as you can see from the bed other pleasures uh, to the ones that Judith has lying in wait for him as a form of, of vengeance. And I think although uh, he is uh, in the story, he is under the influence because of the wonderful dinner that Judith has seduced him with. The reality is that he's still a much bigger, much broader, much stronger figure. And it would take two young women to hold even a, a drunk man down, to hold him down long enough to be able to execute the act uh, of murder that we see Judith uh, uh, in the in the action of here. So I think having her as a young woman gives us that dimension. But the other dimension that it gives us, which I think is a really beautiful quality of Artemisia's work, particularly in the years that she's in Florence, is it gives us a sense of sisterhood. And so again and again in Artemisia's representations of scenes that include Judith, and, and while she lived in Florence, she painted a number of versions uh, of uh, Judith and Holofernes, you always see a very close interaction between between Judith and Abra, her, her handmaiden, there's a, a real sense of them being women working together to a common purpose. And I think that's something that's utterly missing from the work of her male peers who showed this scene again and again in Florence and, and in other cities like Rome as well. So that I think is a unique aspect of Artemisia's work. And that suggests that she has uh, quite a lot of input into the into the composition, how she's going to interpret that scene, and that she's not just merely being told we to go and paint this, or we'll, we'll pay you to go and paint this, and it's going to look like this. It's a very, as you're pointing to, it's quite a unique way of interpreting uh, interpreting this scene. How old was Artemisia when she painted this? So was she still, from the sound of it, still quite a young woman, only recently married and sent off up to Florence, and yet this is an extraordinarily accomplished piece of work right down to interpreting a scene differently that gener generations of other martyr master artists had already interpreted. <laughs> Absolutely. She's 20 years old when she paints this. Artemisia is a prodigy. You know, she grows up in the family of a really established artist, we're told, from the court records uh, in the assault trial that she lives separate to the world of the artist's household uh, that her father has established because it's a very male world and she lacks uh, a strong maternal presence in the family because her mother died when she was quite young. So she grows up kind of in a parallel world to the male world of the artists that her father has established. And he says at her trial that she actually starts painting quite late. It's generally thought that Artemisia comes to painting at 16. So she comes to painting at 16. That means that four years later, she's produced this work while living in Florence. It's one of her first works, we think, when she arrives there and she's already, her reputation has preceded her. Her father has sent letters of introduction to the Medici court before she even gets there, describing exactly that prodigal, na prodigal nature of her work that she is... Her has only been painting for a few years, but she's able, her father says quite proudly, she's able to produce works that are of the quality of any other well-established artist of her time. And the other thing that we should say about Artemisia's work when she's painting this in Florence uh, at age 20 is that, as you say, she's newly married and she's pregnant. It's estimated for 80% of the time that she spends in Florence. She's carrying a child, whether she bears the child to term or not. Uh, she has various miscarriages, children die in infancy, 
Uh, but she's pregnant, it's estimated, for 80% of the time that she's working in Florence. And yet, despite that, she has a lot of commissions from aristocrats associated with the Medici court. And a few years after moving to Florence, in fact, two years um, after moving to Florence, she will be the first woman to be inducted into the official Academy of Art and Design in Florence. That's the Academia where people still go to see David uh, by Michelangelo today. So she's the very first woman in Italy, but in fact, uh, in Europe, to be inducted into a professional arts association like that. So it's extraordinary just how much she's able to achieve in so short a period of time, given that when she produces this work, she we're told has only been painting for four years so then perhaps it becomes unsurprising that she ends up painting in the court of england in naples in rome uh, and has a degree of international success that very very few painters would achieve she's absolutely a trailblazer also in the sense of what you've just described which is the idea that she moves around and that was quite unusual for female artists to be peripatetic it was much more normal for male artists to move where the work was but women artists had to be accompanied by a male relative or a husband they had to have the legal side of their business executed for them by someone else a man obviously because women weren't allowed to sign legal contracts so it was quite difficult for for women artists to move around and, and go where the great commissions were in the same way that their male peers did. But Artemisia did do that. So as you said, she she goes back to Rome. She spends time there. She has a really fruitful period of her career in Naples where we know that she is subcontracting out work to uh, male artists in Naples because the demand for her work is so high that she can't actually satisfy it. And then really interestingly, as you've alluded to, she actually sails by herself, we're told, really unusual, sails by herself, leaving her children uh, behind in Italy to join her father and brothers in England to help her father finish a commission for the Queen's House in London. He's reached a stage in his career and in his uh, trajectory as an alcoholic where he's unable to do a lot of that work on his own and actually needs the assistance of his much more proficient daughter at that point in his life. So she's really quite unusual, uh, probably the most professionalised woman painter in Italy of the 17th century in how she moves around, in how she gains work and also, of course, as we see here in the kind of quality of the work that she produces. Well, thank you very much, Kathleen. And I think in this work you can really see uh, all of those things, that prodigal quality of her as an artist, uh, the skill in her work. And it's almost much easier to imagine how she was able to become so successful if this is what she can do at 20 when she's only been painting for four years. It's really quite extraordinary. You've been listening to Limelight Arts Travel's podcast, A Closer Look. It was recorded on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and we acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional custodians of this land and their elders past and present.